recorded. Okay. Um, welcome back. Good morning. Let's um, get started. Okay. Let's let's just pray and uh, like commit ourselves to God's hands. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for uh, enabling us, Lord, to meet in this fashion. Thank you for the Lord, blessing and privilege, Lord, of uh, of another day, Father God, another day with you, Master. Lord, we thank you for all the wonderful things that you have in store for us, Lord, to reveal to us, to open our eyes to. Father, we thank you that, uh, Lord, every day is a blessing from you, God. Uh, time is a blessing from you. And Father, we thank you that um, even as we consider, Lord, uh, just opening our hearts to you, Father God, we we just ask, Master, that you would speak to us as as you can, as only you can, Lord. And I just pray, Father God, that um, God, that we would uh, walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, as your word says. And um, I pray, Father God, that, um, that we would make um, every opportunity, take every opportunity to Lord, to, to just receive from you, Father God, and to obey your word, Master. We come at this uh, day, we come at these sessions into your mighty hands. We pray that you'll continue to, Lord, speak to us, write your word upon our hearts, Master. We thank you. In Jesus' master's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, we've been looking at uh, 1 Corinthians 9, last uh, last class. And um, so today we will uh, continue. We will look at 1 Corinthians 10, right? Let's, um, let's turn in our notes, or you can turn in our Bible to 1 Corinthians 10, right? Okay, I'm just sharing the notes for the online class. Okay. All right, so uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, we see uh, certain topics that Paul is addressing right so uh, he starts by sharing with with the Corinthian church some lessons he wants to teach them based on the history of Israel right based on some of the wanderings and how the Lord dealt with them and what they did right some of the mistakes they did um, so he's teaching them and uh, so the whole thing is about testing the Lord about complaining against the Lord, about disobeying the Lord, uh, and so some some things that we can derive from that. Then he goes on to talk about uh, it's a, like a continuation of chapter eight. He talks about um, idol worship. He talks about um, the, uh, the sacraments of the church, the communion, and uh, the and in in uh, you know in relation to idol worship, uh, how does this you know this the communion, the Lord's table. Um, uh, what is that relationship? What actually happens when we partake of the Lord's table? So he talks about that, and then uh, you know uh, again finishes this chapter with the this whole thing of food offered to idols. So um, you know those topics two, three, and four they are actually interlinked; they are related, right? Um, so if you look at uh, chapter nine, he was talking about running the race. So he's, he's talking about how a person should discipline one's oneself. In order to live this life, spiritual life, right? He says. Uh, so he talked about his own um, personal experience, and he says that uh, you know I uh, bring my body, I subject my body, right? I discipline my body, and I bring it under in, subjection, so that I don't disqualify myself, right? I don't become disqualified. So he talks about that, and um, so he says that you know you need to live your life, run the race in such a way so you might obtain the prize. So. Uh, about in intentionality, about you know having that objective uh, in living your life, not a, a passive life, but an active life, right? Knowing, uh, and he also uses that analogy of uh, how he fights as not one who punches in the air, but he uh, he says one not one who beats the air, but with certainty, right? So uh, continuing this, so he he talks about uh, Israel. Right when they wandered in the wilderness, right. So he says, um, "Let's read right? verse one." Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers were under the cloud; all passed through the sea; all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Okay, so let's look at that part. So he's saying, um, this is how Israel walked. Uh, I'm, I don't want you to be una unaware of this. I don't want you to be ignorant of this. Okay, so he's you know, sharing about Israel's past, about history. And then he says that all the fathers were under the cloud, meaning that um, he's pointing them to the fact that the Lord, uh, Yahweh, he led them. Uh, uh, and there was this pillar of cloud, uh, which was there during the day and the pillar of fire, which was there during the night. So they were under the cloud. Uh, all of them passed through the sea, referring to the sea that was parted and they walked across the dry land. So uh, he's talking about that. And uh, he says, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So he's talking about the fact that just like how as believers today, we are baptized into the Lord. When we take water baptism into whatever he had accomplished for us. So in a similar way, he says, they were baptized into Moses. In the sense, Moses was their representative. So they could identify with Moses in all the way God dealt with them. You know, it was, uh, it was something that he represented for them and just like a typology of Christ and the church, um, he, they were baptized into um, whatever Moses experienced in the cloud and the sea. Okay, so then verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food, right? meaning that um, the Lord uh, provided for them in the desert. The Lord provided the spiritual food of manna from heaven. So they all ate the same spiritual food. And they all drank the same spiritual drink. So, and, he's, and he's making a reference to the, the rock from which the water came. And he says that the, that rock was Christ. Right? That rock was Christ. So this is another verse which points to the pre-existence of Christ. Right? Where uh, he's talking about the fact that, yes, Christ came into the earth and the fullness of time. But we know that several places where he's referring to the pre-existence of Christ, right? Uh, when we look at Colossians, there also he talks about the pre-existence of Christ. Now, Colossians chapter 1, where um, uh, when we read uh, verse 16, um, all uh, verse uh, 14 onwards, right? In whom we have redemption, referring to Jesus. And through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created. That is Colossians 1 verse 16. By him, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible thrones, dominions. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. That's verse 17. And he is the head of the body, the church, etc. Right? So, um, so pointing to Christ... Who the pre-existence, the preeminence of the Lord Jesus, right? So we see that uh, he's making a reference to that. Right? Okay, let's read from verse six onwards. So he says, "Now these things, what are those things?" He's referring to verse five. He says, "But with most of them, even though they followed the cloud." They experience the supernatural provision of God. They experience the supernatural power of God. But most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And as a result of, as a consequence of that, they died. And then verse 6, now these things became our examples. Their disobedience and the consequence of their disobedience um, became our examples. Examples or patterns that we should not follow. Okay, so we have examples which we can follow. We have examples which we should not follow. So this is like a warning. So he's saying they became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Right. So um, and then uh, just reading from verse seven onwards and do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Okay, so first of all, he's talking about lusting after evil things. Um, we should not do it and don't become idolaters. That's the second thing. Uh, people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. 
and he's talking about idol worship and all that concerns idol worship you know in that phrase verse 8 nor let us commit sexual immorality so that's the third thing that they committed sexual immorality and it says uh, as some of them did and in one day 23000 fell okay nor let us tempt christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition admonition meaning correction upon whom the end of the ages have come okay so listing down those things first lust for evil things now when we read numbers 11 psalm 106 verse 14 um you know you can look at those scriptures um you know um, in detail you can study them later as well so well they they had meat and other delicacies in egypt and there's nothing wrong with that but then the bible says that they craved for meat numbers 11 4 5 talks about that they they had this craving there and it was this lusting you know, which the word which is used there they had this inordinate uh, desire craving and which caused them to complain and talk ill against god you know why have you brought them what brought us here we had all these things and they had this craving so so paul wants you know do not lust after these things crave after these things right second thing they were very quick to so quick to stray away from god and build up something in the place of god you know, exodus 32 uh, maybe we can look into that verse uh, exodus 32 verses 1 to 8 okay right so um this is about the golden calf now when people saw that moses delayed coming down from the mountain right so moses was their representative or god's representative for the people and uh you know he was this bridge between god and them right so when moses delayed coming down from the mountain the people gathered together to aaron and said come make us gods uh, that shall go before us but as for this moses the man who brought us out of the land of egypt we do not know what has become of him right so we know what aaron did because of the pressure right that uh, he faced from these people and pressure to compromise so he took the jewels and made a literally the whatever things that god has given them you know that became an idol for them right he made it into a golden calf and from the material which god himself provided actually god gifted them because when they left the land of egypt people actually gave you know all these things so um so we see that you know idolatry sexual impurity right again referring to numbers 25 where you know they they were immoral uh, acts of immorality and they face the consequence of that as well right um so it talks about uh, their immorality with the Moabites, uh, the Moabite women, and uh, uh, and also uh, they bow down to the gods, uh, and because of the, the their immorality or harlotry with the women of Moab, um, that kind of you know the women actually invited them, the Moabite women invited them to the worship of Baal and so on. Right, so there was. Uh, sexual immorality and impurity so he's warning them against that and that also brought consequences right so um, uh, many were killed that day so he talks about that then do not tempt Christ right? do not test Christ because uh, Exodus 17 and verse 7 they tempted the Lord saying is the Lord among us or not right uh, again in Numbers 21 the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way, and therefore they sp and they spoke against God and against Moses. Right. So um, another warning is in our discouragement, in our times of when we are feeling low, when we have not yet seen the manifestation of God's hand or promise. Right. Um, let us in our discouragement not test God or even uh, you know uh, talk about 
or come to the conclusion that God is not among us and so on, right? Um, forgetting all the things that he has done, forgetting his faithfulness, forgetting all those powerful encounters and the works of God. You know, let's not um, turn things around and look at him and then you know, sh um, uh, rebel against God, right? So he talks about that. Then he points them to complaining and murmuring, right? Um, so complaining and murmuring because of maybe physical discomfort, complaining and murmuring because things are not going their way. Um, so he's, he's saying, you know, that is also dangerous, right? Because the, the Israelites, because of their complaining and murmuring, they were actually, they opened the door for uh, for the enemy to, to destroy them. So verse 12, right, he says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands, take heed, be careful, lest he fall. So these, these five things he points out and saying that that robbed these people, the Israelites, of the destiny in God, the destiny that God had for them. So that really robbed them of this destiny. So uh, in view of this, you know, if you're thinking, if you're saying that, no, I, I, I can stand, I'm fine, everything is fine, be careful uh, lest you fall, right? Um, and then he talks about verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay, so is and the word used there, uh, uh, parasmos, which the Greek word which is used there for temptation, it refers to a period of testing, it refers to a period of trial, uh, and it could be an adversity, you know, meaning a difficult time, it could be a trouble, right? Also, it, it could be used for, you know, what we normally use the word temptation for, you know, it's an invitation or an inducement to sin, right? So it can be used in either of these contexts, right? So here, He's using it in the context of a testing or a trial um, or maybe even inducement, but mostly for testing and trial. So he's saying, you know, that God is faithful who will not allow you to be tested, will not allow you to go through this, you know, this trial beyond what you are able, but also will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So there is always this exit or a way of escape or bringing to an end that God provides, right? So this testing time, this trial happens to everyone. Um, well, God is not the one who tempts us. We know that Satan comes to tempt us because he is the tempter, right? That is the one of the titles, right? He is the father of lies. He's the tempter. So he's the one who brings the temptation. But God provides the way out, right? God provides the way out. So he talks about that. Then he says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Okay. So in the having said all this, having explained about what Israel went through, the, the way in which they fell, the way in which their destiny um, you know, was not fulfilled in God, saying, in the view of all this, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from making anything a substitute for God. And here, in for the Corinthians, the, the, it was directly worship of other gods, worship of other deities, right? So he's saying, don't even dabble with that. You know, flee, flee from idolatry, right? Um, so another place where he says flee or run away from is in chapter six, right? Run away from sexual immorality and right? flee sexual immorality. Okay, so um, so so that is something that we see here. Um, then he goes on to talk about any any uh, clarifications or questions in this till now, whatever we've seen, before we move on to the next one. Okay. 
right? Okay. Uh, if there are, just make a note of it, right? Okay. Let's look at um, uh, the next one. So, so he's saying, therefore, flee from idolatry. You know, don't be, don't indulge in idolatry in any way. Um, and we saw, you know, idolatry was everywhere, very prevalent in the Corinthian uh, culture, right? So he's writing about that. Then he goes on to talk about communion. It's interesting what he says, right? Um, I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one body, or one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? Okay, so he's talking, about, he's bringing, uh, you know, the significance of the Lord's table. Now, uh, th that, so which means that this was something that was practiced, like right? as the Lord instructed the disciples, uh, what we call as the Last Supper. Uh, he instructed them to continue doing it, to proclaim the Lord's death, to continue to doing it till He comes. So that is what we see. So the church obviously continued doing this, right? And wherever the disciples went or wherever the apostles went, when they shared the gospel, this was something that they taught also. We see that in Acts chapter 3 also, we see that they continued in the apostles' doctrine and in the breaking of the bread. So which means this is something that the early church continued to practice, right? The sacrament or the communion. Um, we see water baptism was something that they did. We see communion also something that they practice, right? So, so obviously they knew about it. So he's saying, you know, this cup of blessing. So he's talking about uh, the uh, the the what what was drunk, right? That is symbolic of the blood of Christ, but he calls it the cup of blessing, right? So which means that. In referring to the sacrifice, in referring to the the blood that was shed uh, for us, now it it was designed, or it was with the intent of bringing blessing into our lives, right? So when we're looking at yes, we 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 you know we we talk about the suffering that the Lord went through. We talk about the you know we are reminded of the physical suffering. We are reminded of what He carried, the sin of the world. We are reminded of the curse that he carried. We are reminded of, uh, you know, every physical sum symptom that he carried, which is which we see in Isaiah fifty-three verses four and five. You know, all that is true, but we also see that the truth of it is that it's a, it was with the intent to bring blessing into our lives, which means that there is a exchange that's happening, right? To bring blessing into our lives. Another verse which talks about that is Galatians three. Right, Galatians three thirteen. Galatians three and verse thirteen. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, "Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree." Verse fourteen. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Right. So the blessing of Abraham. So it is a cup of blessing. What does he say? The cup of blessing that which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? So that word communion, meaning koinonia, which means partnership, which means fellowship, right? Which means, uh, uh, you know, when we say communion, we're saying talking about something that is deep, something that is not the heart, right? So he's saying, you know, this is what it is, partnership, friendship, fellowship. So when we partake, we are actually partnering with what Christ did for us, partnering with that sacrifice that Christ did on the cross. Right? So we are actually receiving, we are partaking of what he did for us on the cross, the blood that was shed. So it's a, it is designed to... So what, what is happening is when we actually... It's a physical act, it's a symbolic act, but it's significant in the in the in in the sense that something we are receiving. 
okay something spiritual is happening even in that natural physical act okay so he's talking about the significance of that so it's very important for us to know that that in that physical seemingly simple natural physical act even though it is symbolic right something spiritual is taking place there is a spiritual exchange that that is taking place right it is designed to bring blessing into our lives because that is what the cross brings into our lives the blessing of abraham right okay so then he talks about the bread the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of christ so again the fellowship the partnership the friendship um, you know we are partakers of the body of christ so we are one body in christ jesus and he also says we are one bread right we are though we are many we are one body and one bread we all partake of that one bread so in verse 18 it says are, are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar so what happens was that as part of the worship when the priests when they part when they take part you know in the in the worship they were eating the sacrifices the priests would eat the sacrifices just uh, at the altar uh, and even if we look at the tabernacle we uh, uh, you know they would partake of the bread the priests would partake of the show bread which was there on the table right so this meant that they were one fellowship they were partakers and that is what is you know that, that we are partakers of the altar right the that we are actually one with what is happening it is a worship we are partakers of the altar right so uh, so this is what the whole communion or the lord's table signified so this is what it it meant that you are actually a partaker of the altar just like how in the old testament also they partook of the food and they were partakers of the altar right so that is the spiritual aspect of blessing and sharing and and fellowship and becoming one with whatever the lord did for us on the cross and recipients of whatever we receive because of the finished work of jesus on the cross okay verse 19 then he goes on to say you know what am i saying right that an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything right the same thing that we saw right chapter 8 they said chapter 8 uh, he said you know what does it mean does does it mean that idol is anything and uh, or uh, you know uh, is um, the food is anything food does not commend us to god or does not uh, you know is is very clear that food is not something that um, brings us closer to god food is not something that separates us from god um you know so he, 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 so he is very clear that you know whatever you do uh, even in the temple if you are eating what will happen to the weaker brother okay you're not being a stumbling block you're not being a barrier for that person's faith or you're not cause of cause to fall for that other person so he's very clear about that right so again he's repeating that what am i saying am i saying that the idol is anything it's a false it's a substitute it's a false god so you know it's it's not it's nothing we know that this all powerful sovereign god he is the one true god so verse 19 what am i saying then that an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything verse 20 rather that the things which the gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons and not to god and i do not want you to have fellowship with demons okay so now this is the spiritual aspect of this whole thing of food being offered to idols right so he's saying i don't want you to have fellowship with demons right so just like how when you take part in the communion you are actually taking part with what the lord did it's a spiritual thing that is happening even though it's a physical act there's a spiritual thing you're communing you're partnering you're you're declaring or having friendship with the lord so he's saying i do not want you to have fellowship 
this koinonia, this partnership, friendship, right? This communion with demons. Right? Verse 21, for you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. So um, in the Corinthian, you know, when you read some of the history, you see that in the Corinthian culture, there were these... Um, there were these gatherings that were happening and typically they would say you know they would use this phrase the table of uh, you know they, they would issue an invitation you know you're welcome to come and take part at the table of some deity okay whatever x table of x table of y so some deity some god goddess is mentioned there so what does that mean that means you're invited to be part of that feast you're invited to be part of that gathering where everything was taking place uh, in order to honor that deity, in order to worship that deity. Okay, So there would be eating, there would be drinking, there would be sexual immorality, etc. But it was called the table of such and such a thing. No. So just like how communion is the table of the Lord, right? the cup that you drink is a cup of the Lord. It's a cup of blessing. If you drink of the cup or if you're partaking of what is happening as an act of worship to demons, so he's saying, you know, verse 21, you cannot, it's called the cup of demons, right? Or it's called the table of demons, right? So he's talking about worship. He's talking about taking part and attending those kind of invitations, being part of it and, you know, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, being part of that whole spiritual aspect of worship unto idols and demons, right? So, so he's that's why he's saying he's warning, you know, do not, um, do not be part of that, right? Verse twenty-two. So he's he's talking about the whole worship part, right? When they are offering and when they are, uh, do not be partaker. So, which means that in the Corinthian culture, there were some who would come to church who would. Be part of the worship who would take part in the lord's table at the same time they would not think twice about being part of the table of demons they would go attend that also be part of that whole thing and eat the food offered uh, and you know and therefore be part of that spiritually be partakers of what was happening there so he's warning them that's why he says flee idolatry uh, uh, and then he's warning them and he's saying do we provoke the lord to jealousy are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Okay, so while we know that, well, an idol is nothing, well, we know that food offered to idol is nothing, right? So he's saying it is not helpful, it is not edifying. And moreover, from chapter 8, we see that it is also something that causes, a, uh, that puts a cause to fall for other believers right so uh, so this is the what he is warning this is what he is warning them and he's saying you know i don't want you to be associated with the worship or the spiritual aspect of the worship of demons okay so so this whole thing of idol worship you know it's not a simple answer right so it has many layers uh, so as we as we read that while on, on one hand, while Paul says that it's nothing, it is nothing. Food offered of idols is nothing, idol is nothing. And on the other hand, he's talking about the very act of worship and the, all the rituals being performed while it is designed to have communion with demons, you know, this table of demons. And therefore, he's warning them, I don't want you to be partakers of that, right? Let's look at, um, you know, the rest of the verses and... Uh, yeah. Um, so eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions, right? For conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Okay. So we, we looked at that, that there was meat which was sacrificed, uh, which was offered to certain deities, everything. And then it was sold in the meat market. And there was a special price to it because it was considered a blessing, right? So it was there. So he's saying, you know, uh, 
whatever is sold, eat. Right? Don't ask any questions. Just eat for conscience sake. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Right? And uh, similarly, you know, we look at 1 Timothy 4, verses 3 to 5. This is what he says. You know, um, Certain commandments to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. He says, for every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Uh, we need to understand that such a radical statement by someone who's coming from a Jewish background, right? Uh, so similarly, Peter also went through that, right? When uh, when he received that revelation about Gentiles, right? About salvation for Gentiles, and uh, in that vision when which God you know, where God revealed that truth that he needs to step out. Uh, there's been a breaking of walls and so on, right? So, so here also he's saying, you know, uh, in 1 Timothy 4, he's saying, you know, there are some heretical teachings. Uh, they forbid to marry and, uh, you know, commanding to abstain from foods, etc. He's saying, so, you know, every creature of God is good. Nothing is to be refused. If it is received with thanksgiving, it is sanctified. It is made clean by the word of God and prayer. Okay, so that's why he says the earth is the Lord's and its fullness. So, you know, don't worry about it. You, if it's sold in the meat market, no problem. Go eat it. You know, buy it, eat it. And then he goes on to say, verse twenty-seven: If any of those who do not believe, okay, so this is a non-believer, one who does not believe in Christ, invites you to dinner, and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions. Right? No problem. Just go for it. But if anyone says to you, you know what, this was offered to idols. right? Do not eat it. Why? For the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and its fullness. The same thing he says, you know, it's fine, but do not. When, when someone says, okay, this was offered, this was offered as an act of worship. Don't eat it for the sake of the that person's conscience. He says, verse 29, conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake of thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? So he's talking about uh, you know, a, a person who is who has actually been in worship, who has received food offered to idols as an act of worship, as an act of blessing from the idol. And he or she wants to share with you and saying, hey, this, you know, this is a blessing we received from this God. This is a blessing. So if you eat it, you will be blessed. And then they, you know, say all that. Then he says, you know, do not eat. Okay. Uh, why? Is it because that something bad is going to happen to you? No. Do not eat it for the sake of the conscience of that person. Okay. So in the verses before that, when he's talking about table of demons and table of, we need to understand it. So he's not. Um, he's referring to taking part and being part of a worship gathering, right? Being part of a, being actively part of that worship, because that is what a table of demons meant, where people would gather to worship and they would do that. And so Corinth was facing such a, uh, uh, sorry, the church in Corinth was facing such a such an issue where people would freely go and say, okay, anyway. You know, I'll go for that. I'll go for this. I'll partake in that. I'll eat what is there. I'll, you know, eat what is here. Um, you know, without any, without any problem. They were doing that, and then Paul is saying, correcting them, is giving the right perspective. What would happen spiritually? What is, you know, what is going to happen when you take part, when you're actively participating in the table of demons, right? So, if you're going to a friend's house, they're not believers, but they offer something, and you just eat it. Well, everything is, you know, you eat it with thanksgiving and prayer, no problem. But if they specifically say that this is a blessing from this so and so God, then, you know, you refuse it. Obviously, you do it with grace and love. Why? The reason is that that person considered is at a blessing from God. You do it for the sake of that person's conscience. Right. So, so that's the thing, right? So um, we don't refuse it because of fear. 
you don't refuse it because of fear of an idol you don't refuse it because you know of some consequence that's going to happen to you no right so we do it because of these reasons okay um verse 31 to 33 therefore whether you eat or drink or whatever you do do all to the glory of god give no offense either to jews or to greeks or to the church of god just as i also please all men in all things not seeking my own profit but the profit of many that they may be saved okay so we know that um, you know a, Th th this is the way Paul lived, right? This is the way, this was his lifestyle. And sometimes we mistake this last verse, right? Verse 33, I please all men in all things. We think, okay, um, it means that I'm going to be a man pleaser, right? So what Paul says in other places, you know, if I seek to please men, then I don't glorify God. I don't please God. Right? So, is talk, not talking about pleasing men, pleasing their whims and fancies, or you know, pleasing uh, what they believe. No, you st you do this without compromising the truth. Like Paul also says, right? Like I become all things to all men that I might save some. Okay, where does he say that? Did we see that earlier? Was um, chapter nine, right? Chapter nine, verse. 20 um, verses 19 onwards is is sharing this from a point of reaching out building bridges from the place of serving them and winning them over right so though i am free from all men i have made myself a servant to all that's verse 19 that i might win the more we're looking at 1 corinthians chapter 9 verse 20 and to the jews i became as a jew that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Verse 21, for those who are without law, which means non-Jews, as without law, not being without law towards Christ, but under law towards Christ, which means that when I become all things to all men, it's not like I compromise the standards of God's word. Right? Not that I compromise scripture. So that's very important for us to know. No, I please men in all things without compromising the truth, without compromising on scripture. So that is what it is. Now we need to look at it. When we take that verse out of the context in which he's saying it, then it becomes very dangerous. You know, I do anything, I compromise. Why? At the end of the day, I might save. No, it's not about compromising. Okay. Um, he says, also says, give no offense, right? But we know that the message of Christ is offensive. Right? Which means that people get offended because we say, Jesus is the only way. And the cross is the only way through which a person becomes saved. So the message of the gospel is inherently, while it brings liberty and freedom, is inherently offensive to people who do not consider, you know, the truth. So, so when we're saying give no offense, it means that yes, the message is inherently offensive, but you don't go ahead and intentionally offend people with your words, offend people or dishonor people because of their beliefs. You know, don't offend them. So he's saying either to Jews or Greeks or to the Church of God, don't offend people. Right. So don't be maybe you know being impolite, being rude, or uh, not in all these ways. Right. So don't offend people. Right. Okay. So um, with that, we come to the end of uh, chapter ten. Right. Uh, before we move on, any questions or any thoughts that you might have? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. In uh, one Timothy and in Acts. Uh, that they show God show the sheet to Peter and in Timothy saying you can have any food it's, but that's considering the Gentiles no yeah or so the food. no 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 so in, in Acts it was considering the Gentiles so he was uh, so Peter being a Jewish man God was showing him all the non-Jewish diet 
and saying that you know rice eat and ki- uh, you know uh, kill and eat so he's saying no i'm a jewish person i should not do this so for him it made sense when he went to cornelius house so as he was speaking then it says hey actually this is what this vision meant what what was it i'm going to a non jewish person's place the salvation is for a non jewish person who is different from a jew so that is what it meant but when we look at first timothy you see that he very specifically is saying that you know the earth is the lords and the fullness thereof so uh whatever is there sold you eat it you partake of you you give thanks and you eat it's fine yeah uh, recently i heard some and he is from pentecostal background he said no fish with scales you can should not eat mm. that does it jewish law actually does it hold good now i am does the jewish dietary law hold good now well there is value health benefits for sure right uh, and there's a reason why god says you know don't eat uh, the swine or you know so there is a reason because that was how it was it was you eating all refuse and everything and so uh, you know there is health benefit high fat content <laughs> etc you know but if you're looking at it from a truth perspective if that is what this culture has if this is what they are growing and they're growing it hygienically etc there's no problem so that's the thing yeah yeah right exactly so so that's the thing but if somebody wants to yeah eat in moderation etc health wise but if somebody wants to you know like, like he's talking about you know uh, if somebody eats vegetables don't look down upon them like we see uh, i forget where romans i think yeah, it says you know, if somebody who's maybe they're considering vegetables and they eat vegetables that's fine so don't destroy someone's faith based on food you know so that's the objective yeah which one ah oh, first timothy 4 um it's it's there in the notes actually uh, first timothy okay uh, first timothy chapter 4 and uh, what verse is that 3 yeah 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 okay we'll take a break and then come back bye